should be live. There we go. I'm live on Facebook. Prophet David Taylor here. It's your weekly live prophetic word. I stopped by to tell you that God is a good God. I stopped by to tell you that his love is unconditional. His grace is unmerited favor and his mercy is undeserved. God is a good God. I'm happy and proud to be a part of his kingdom and be a part of that system and have that relationship because it's not my love for him. It's his love for me. We love him because he first loved us. So if you're listening to this right now, you're watching me right now, whether on live or replay, I invite you with all my heart to get to know the God of heaven. For he is my sister, hey sis, because he is a good God, good God. There is nothing you could do to make him love you any more. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you any less. He just loves you because his love is not based on how you act. <laughs> I know, I know, I know that's a trip because that's not the way man does it. That's not the way we do it. Everything we do is so totally conditional but that's not the way God does it. His love is not based on how you act, Romans 5 and 8. For God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father gave Jesus and Jesus gave his life while we were yet sinners. That means his love is not based on how we act. I know that just explodes your brain because that's not human, that's divine. All right, it's 2.30, we're gonna jump right in because I like to start on time. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. Thank you for your unconditional love that is absolutely mind-blowing. Thank you, God, that you love those that serve you and those that don't, that you love those that are with you in glory, those that are on earth and those that are under the earth. Oh, God, for you paid the same price for us all. Thank you for your great love that is beyond our comprehension, but not beyond our experience. We can experience it. We're never going to fully understand it but we can show experience it. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, Father, for giving Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. And thank you for sending the Holy Ghost. And thank you, Holy Ghost, for all that you give us, wisdom, knowledge, vision, understanding. So right now, Father, I should fill me with the Holy Ghost for giving me for any sin, washing me clean. Oh God, I must decrease so that you might increase. I die to myself right now. And I say, not my will, but thine be done. So you speak through me, you breathe through me, you let what is said be what you want said to your glory and your honor. And so that the saints might be edified. So the demons would be terrified. And so unbelievers would be mortified to live one more day without you. So, so that the spirit of God might bring conviction. And let unbelievers know they don't need to live one more day, one more moment without getting right with you. For that is truly what matters. So I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be a part of your program. We give you all the glory. I bless your name. We're looking for you to do great things and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow those that believe and receive this prophetic word. In Jesus' name we pray and I declare and decree it. Amen. All right, here we go. Today's prophetic word is lightning. Today's prophetic word is lightning. Let me put that on the screen. Now, this particular scripture we're going to look at, we're going to look at some other scriptures connected to it. You've heard me teach on it before, but there's some new stuff that the Holy Spirit wants to uh, uh, show us this day. I want to get myself above the title, okay, lightning. So we're going to go to our scripture, which is going to be, we're actually, gonna, I'm going to read 2 Samuel 22, 15, then I'm going to go back and read 2 Samuel 22, 1 through 15. So let me put that on the screen so you know where we are. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 15. So first I'm going to read the 15th verse, and then I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Here is 2 Samuel 22, 15, New International Version. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy with great bolts of lightning, he routed them. New Living Translation, he shot arrows and scattered his enemies. His lightning flashed and they were confused. Um, King James Bible, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. 
New King James Version. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. That's 2 Samuel 22, 15 in many different translations. Uh, Berean Study Bible, he shot his arrows and scattered the foes. He hurled lightning and routed them. Okay, now I'm gonna read 2 Samuel 22, uh, 22, 1 through 15 to give you the context and to show you what the Holy Ghost wants to share with us today. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 to 15, reading from the King James Version. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior, thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. When the ways of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. Now, why do I read the scripture? Because I know some people, uh, that's the only scripture they're gonna hear all week. And because you need to, need to get the context of what the larger passage of scripture is saying. Today's prophetic word is about getting out of a victim mentality if you're a Christian. Lord have mercy. You've heard so much teaching on the Lord saying, you're supposed to forgive 70 times seven. And I recently did a, a message on forgiveness. We are supposed to forgive so that we don't have to stay in jail to what's happened to us. Because when you don't forgive, when you hold on to the debt, you stay incarcerated to what happened to you and then bitterness and anger and so many things can grow from that. So the Lord commands us to forgive, to release the debt so that we don't have to remain in jail to what happened. That has been twisted uh, by uh, scriptures that have been taken out of context and pushed too far one way. Whenever you have a scripture going in one direction, you have a balancing scripture going in the other direction to achieve the balance because God is just in balance. And when you have heard too many scriptures going in one direction, it begins to uh, paint a false picture and it can also move into dogma. Faith is not dogma. Faith is when you believe what God says. And also when you get a rhema or a prophetic word from God about what he's saying about that situation. Dogma is when your mind is closed to any other information and you've made up your mind based on something and you haven't examined it. You haven't asked God about it. You've already just concluded that it's going to be this way. And you're going to stay right there, even if it costs you some stuff. Because that's why I do a No More Genies broadcast, because some people have let their kids die because they dogmatically believed that God had to heal the child apart from medicine. Sometimes the answer is take your child to the doctor. Sometimes the answer is take your medicine. Why would God give us medicine? Don't you know that some herbs in the ground are natural medicine? Don't you know that you have white blood cells in your body that work with your T cells? to form antibodies, to fight whatever disease comes in your bloodstream. So do you, so do you understand that demanding that God heal you apart from medicine, that God heals you one certain way is dogma. That's not faith. That's why some people have done that and their kids died. Because you have to ask the Lord, how is my healing? What do you want me to do? Do you want me to confess something? Do you want me to go to the doctor? Do I need to change my diet? Do I need to lose weight? Whatever God says, because God is a person, 
not a set of rules. But when you only hear scripture going a certain way, and that's all you ever hear, it gets out of balance. And then it can turn into dogma. And then you say, God has to do it this way. And God don't have to do nothing no certain way. <laughs> okay? God locks himself into what he says, but he leaves the methods wide open. That's why when Jesus walked to earth as a man, you see him healing many people in many different ways. Sometimes he just spoke the word. Sometimes he wasn't even in their presence. Sometimes he just released the authority of his word. Sometimes he laid his hands on them. With that blind man, he actually spit on the ground and made some spittle, some mud clay, and put it on that man's eyes, okay? To that man that was lame that was by the pool. He said, take up your bed and walk. He just spoke the words, okay? When he raised a little girl from the dead, he grabbed her hand and said, Talitha Kumai, or damsel, I say to thee, arise. So you can't lock the Lord into a method of healing, and that's where people get dogmatic. And they start saying stuff like, I'm not going to take my medicine because God's going to heal me apart from medicine. If the Lord told you that, then it'll happen. If the Lord told you to take your medicine, if your healing didn't happen all at once, if the Lord told you to change your diet, you might be eating something that you're having an allergic reaction to if you didn't know that. See what I mean? But when things get preached and taught that go in one direction, they get out of balance, and then they become dogma. And then you say that that is the answer to every situation. So we've heard so many scriptures about 70 times seven until people started believing. And this is why a lot of men don't want to be a part of Christianity, that being a Christian means being a victim. That is not, oh, Lord have mercy. That is not what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian means you don't have to deliver yourself. Let me say that one more time. Being a Christian does not mean being a victim. Forgiveness does not mean you are a victim. Being a Christian means you don't have to deliver yourself. It means that God Almighty will fight for you. That's why you don't have to raise your hand because God will raise his hand. You understand? But you have probably heard 70 times seven forgiveness so much until now it develops kind of this victim mentality. And then people begin to believe that being a Christian is about how much abuse you can take and still keep smiling. You know that's not in the Bible, right? <laughs> you know that ain't nowhere in the Bible, right? That being a Christian is about how much abuse you can take and still keep smiling. You understand that, right? And the other scripture I want to talk about is when Paul says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers, uh, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we have to take the whole armor of God. Okay, that scripture has been, been preached and taught so much until what has been glossed over is the very real reality that sometimes you're dealing with wicked people. Sometimes we're dealing with the devil and demons and you have to study demonology and learn, oh, there's Donna, hey, Donna. And sometimes you have to learn, uh, well, all Christians have to learn uh, demonology so you can learn how to cast out demons. Sometimes you're dealing with wicked people, okay? It's not necessarily an unclean spirit on them. It might be, but it's sometimes it's wickedness and evil in the heart. That's all in the Bible. Even Paul had to deal with wicked people sometimes. So, so, so we have been taught so hard and, you know, just love, love, love and forgive, forgive, forgive and, all, and turn the other cheek and all that. We've heard so much of that until, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul wasn't saying that we don't have to deal with uh, flesh and blood or wicked people, enemies. He was saying that there's a whole organized kingdom of darkness out there, that Satan's kingdom is organized and it's full of all kinds of unclean spirits. And that's the root of what we're dealing with is that organization in the spiritual world. But out here in the natural, sometimes you're dealing with wicked people. Sometimes you're dealing with your enemies. Sometimes you're dealing with people that hate you. Now they might be operating in a spirit a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of envy, a spirit of murder, a spirit of racism, but they're still doing that. You know how I know that's true? Because they're responsible for their choices. If it was all the devil, that means God would never judge us. Just think about that. Just let that hit. If it was all the devil, how could there ever be judgment in a human's life if you didn't have nothing to do with it? So you might be operating 
under an influence of an unclean spirit and you need that broken off you. But ultimately, you're responsible for your choices. If that weren't true, how could God ever judge us? How come when King David committed adultery and had committed adultery and had got Bathsheba pregnant and then tried to cover it up? And then when that didn't work, he had her husband and all the men in his regiment killed. How come when Nathan the prophet came to rebuke David, how come David didn't say, well, you know, that was the devil? There might have been some lust demons, some lust spirits, some unclean spirits operating in that relationship. But that was David making a choice to sleep with Bathsheba and then have her husband killed. And God judged him. Did you notice that? So, so that scripture that where Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, uh, uh, spiritual weakness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Paul is trying to tell you that there is a spiritual kingdom of darkness, a hierarchy of demons that's behind the activities of Babylon or the world system or the devil system. Paul is trying to tell you that there is a whole organized structure. Uh, and Satan has a trinity, if you didn't know that, because Satan imitates God. So the Holy Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, Satan has a trinity too. Satan is the anti-father. The beast is the anti-Christ, the anti-Jesus, the anti-son. And the false prophet is the anti-Holy Spirit. So he has a whole entire kingdom that's organized. And Paul was saying that we're dealing with that. But Paul was not saying that we're not also dealing with wicked people, because I'm going to say it one more time. If we could blame everything on the devil, why would God ever judge people? Just let that hit. That's what I'm saying. That's why you have to learn how to study the Bible, because whenever there's one principle going one way, there's another principle going another way to bring the truth into balance. And we have spent so much time listening to 70 times seven forgiveness until now men feel like being a Christian is being a victim. And that's not what the Bible is teaching. And we've listened to spiritual weakness in high places and principalities, all of which principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world, all of which is true because there are literally thrones that demons sit on. There are demons that sit on territories. There are some low level demons that just tremble when you say Jesus name. And then there's some old fat demons that have been around for a long time. Like an old demon is a Jezebel. Jezebel's an old demon. Mammon, the love of money, that's a very old demon. Racism, racism is an old demon. They squat on entire territories, sometimes entire countries, sometimes entire continents. That's what Paul's saying, that's what we're up against. Those are the giants in the spirit that we're dealing with. That's why those demons are so powerful from generation to generation. You see what I mean? But that doesn't mean there aren't wicked people, okay? Don't you remember that Jesus told Judas not to let the devil enter his heart and deceive Judas into betraying Jesus? Don't you remember Jesus point blank told Judas, don't do that, okay? Don't do what the devil's trying to get you to do. But the Bible says the devil already entered his heart and deceived him, and then the Lord said, that thou do is do it quickly. But Judas was the one responsible for selling Jesus out. Did you notice that? Judas, Judas took the 30 pieces of silver. And then when, after he sold Jesus out, he tried to take it back. And then he ended up, depending on the difference account, Judas, Judas ended up, his gut spilled out over a field and or he hung himself. Maybe both happened. Maybe he hung himself and his gut spilled out. Okay. But the point I'm trying to make is Jesus said point blank that the devil was putting that in Judas's heart. That did not absolve Judas of his responsibility for selling out the body and blood of Christ. Do you understand that? So we're trying to move away from this idea of saying that we're only fighting the devil. We are fighting the devil and his kingdom, but sometimes we're fighting wicked people. That's what you've got to understand. That's what Esther was about. Wicked Haman. That's what Nehemiah was about, Sam Ballad and all the people that came by and made fun of him while he was rebuilding the wall. Remember that Job's friends came by and the Lord said, my wrath is kindled against thy friends, not my wrath is kindled against the devil. Because remember the conversation that God had with the devil triggered everything that happened in the book of Job. And God said, my wrath is kindled against your friends because they have spoken 
that about me, God says, which is not right. God does not like us saying things about him that aren't true. He said, my wrath's kindled against them. You see that? So I'm trying to help you understand that the Bible is not just dealing with our fight with demons. The Bible is dealing with our fight with wicked people. Because there's the devil and there's some people full of the devil. Okay? And so today's scripture is about getting you out of a victim mentality. Say it with me. If I am a Christian, I am not a victim. I'm going to put that on the screen. If I am a Christian, I am not a victim. That's coming up on the screen right now. Say it with me. If I am a Christian, I am not a victim. So when the Lord tells us to turn the other cheek, when the Lord tells us to forgive 70 times seven, what he means is that you don't have to defend yourself, not you become a doormat or, or a beating rug or something for somebody to torment and just beat up. That's religion told you that. That's crazy people told you that. Jesus ain't told you that. That's what we're reading today in 2 Samuel about what God did for his man, David. So let me give you another principle, okay? So I've already given you one principle that being a Christian means you're not a victim. I gave you a second principle, which means it doesn't, it means that you don't have to raise your hand and deliver yourself. It doesn't mean there won't be any deliverance, okay? But we're gonna read this some more and you will understand that here comes the third principle. Don't nobody that doesn't serve God, know God or fear God, have the right to have the victory over you. Let me put that on the screen too. No unbeliever has a right to have the victory over the believer. Put it on the screen right now. Okay. No unbeliever has a right to have the victory over the believer. No wicked person. Nobody that serves the devil, no one that's still in the kingdom of darkness, no one that doesn't know God, doesn't honor God. That's huge because God always honors those that honor him. But when you have people living in a way that does not honor God, nobody like that has a right to have, a vic to have the victory over you. You're not a victim. It just means you don't have to do the fighting. Let me say that one more time. You're not a victim. It means you don't have to do the fighting. And the reason that is such a blessing is because there's only so much you could do with your hand anyway. Think about it. <clears throat> when those people physically fought in the Old Testament, they fought with angels. They fought with the hand of God on them. That's how Joshua beat all them people. That's how Samson beat all them people. That's how David beat all them people. They didn't do that naturally. So even in the Old Testament, when they did physically have to fight. They fought with angelic divine help. But this verse is talking about how you don't even have to let it get to the physical. You don't have to defend yourself. You can call on God. So what's the problem? The problem is, or the challenge is, which is why the Holy Ghost told me to bring this today, is that you can't do it if you never heard it. The way things work in the kingdom of God is by HBO. You have to hear God. You have to believe God. You have to obey God. HBO. Hear, believe, and obey. But you can't hear it if it's never been preached or prophesied or taught to you. You have to hear it. And then that's how you develop faith for it. So that's why the Spirit of God led me to bring this today so that we could hear what God did for David and begin to, de to develop our faith to understand that God is not a respecter of person, which means that if he gave David that kind of deliverance to where he God fought like that, He'll fight that way for me. So let's look at it again in that context. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 22. David said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, the God of my rock, and him will I trust. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. Now, out of all the people in the world, to say that would be saved from violence. David was a bloody man. David was a warrior. David was killing lions and bears with his bare hands before he ever met Goliath. That's what gave him the faith to go against Goliath. 
because that wasn't the first time God had delivered him from an enemy that was bigger than him. But now King David is saying his faith went to another level to where he didn't have to fight, okay? So the God of my rock and evil I trust, he's my shield. He's a horn of my salvation. Uh, the, the, a horn can represent your harvest. A horn can be the thing you blow that goes out before you when you get ready to go on the battlefield. My high tower, in other words, God can see all the players in the game. He sees all the elements. My refuge, meaning he's where I go to hide. My savior, which is clear, he saves me. He saves me from violence. So when people are trying to come against me, this is what King David said. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies, my enemies. Then he gets deeper. When the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men, there it is. That's not talking about demons. <laughs> Verse 2 Samuel 22, 5, when the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. There it is. Wicked people. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. What does that mean? That means it was hell everywhere. And David said, I thought I was going out. I thought this was it. I've been there. I've been in situations where I thought this was it. I kid you not. More than once. If I told you my testimony, you wouldn't believe me. Because I've been there more than one time where I thought this was it. Then I was like, this can't be it. I can't go out like this. Then he said, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. There it is and cry to my God. And let me stop right there and tell you something. You're going to have to get rid of pride when it's time to call on God. In my distress, I call upon the Lord and I cry to my God. So you can't be bringing God this, this macho stuff if you're a dude saying that you can't cry before the Lord. Yes, you can. You don't have to cry in front of other people, but you're going to have to take that mask off in front of God. One thing I found out about the Lord is that the Lord is not listening until you cry from your heart. God don't hear your phoniness. That's what I'm trying to say. When you're doing this right here, when you're just running your mouth and you're not sincere, that don't move the Lord. I found that out in my life. It's when this here open up, when your heart open up and you take your mask off and you stop pretending. Okay. So David said, in my stress, I call upon the Lord, cry to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, his temple in heaven, and my cry did enter into his ears. Then, now watch what happened, verse eight. Then the earth shook and trembled. David said, there's an earthquake. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wrong. In other words, when you told God about them ungodly men that was all around you, he got angry. Do you know why? Because no one that doesn't honor God has a right to get the victory over those that do. Some of y'all, that's the first time in your life you ever heard anybody say that. Some of y'all have been dealing with situations sometimes for decades because you don't understand. If you just read just the Old Testament, we don't even have to get to the New Testament. If you just read the Old Testament, every time there was some wicked oppression, Nehemiah, Esther, King David, uh, anytime the children of Israel were dealing with their enemies, anytime there was somebody wicked, that's what Samson's life was about, was judging Israel and killing the Philistines. Anytime there was somebody wicked trying to get the victory over Israel, one way or the other, God delivered them. One way or the other, God said, them people that don't know me don't get to have the victory over my children. Just let that hit. Think about all the times in your life where things could have been different if you had had what I just said in your faith arsenal. That don't nobody that don't know God have a right to have a victory over those. It's not about us. It's about him. Because God honors those that honor him. And you're out there and you don't pay your tithes and you blaspheme his name. You live any kind of way you want to live, and you have no respect for his word, and you have no respect for his presence, and you have no respect for his anointing, and you have no respect for his people, and you have no respect for his spirit. What in the world make you think that somebody like that has the right to have victory over those of us that fear him and bow down before him and love him and honor him? No, they don't. But you got to believe that, okay? Uh, God was angry. There, there went up a smoke out of his nostrils, verse 9 and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. God literally breathed fire. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. Now in other translations, this is talking about brimstone and hailstorms. This is the same thing that happened with Moses. When God sent the 10 plagues of Egypt, that's what I'm saying. This stuff is literal. It's not metaphor in case you think it's just poetic. When Moses delivered the Hebrew children from Pharaoh, 
one of the plagues was brimstone. It rained fire from heaven. So this is literal. This is not allegory. He rode upon a chair, but did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He bowed the heavens also and came down darkness under his feet, 10. He rode upon a chair, but did fly, and he was seen on the wings of the wind, 11, verse 12. He made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies, thunderstorms. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled, lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. The Lord thundered from heaven, and God opened his mouth, and here's verse 15. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. Today's prophetic word is lightning to help you understand. Now that word discomfited, uh, when you research that, that word is talking about confusion. It's talking about uh, how they became afraid that the enemies of God went into a panic. And that's not the first time God did something like that. He also did that in 2 Kings 7, 6, where he made the Arameans to hear the sounds of chariot to where it sounded like they were surrounded and they panicked. So what I'm trying to say is this is consistent with the stories we see in the Old Testament. So what that means is that they, the enemies became afraid, they panicked, they became discombobulated, okay? Sometimes they fled, in some cases they turn on themselves, kill themselves with a sword. But the point I'm trying to make is that God came down when David called him with earthquakes, thunderstorms, rain, hail, brimstone, and lightning. He showed up in nature and showed out. Now, what is the point of me saying this today? I'll tell you the point. The point my son said, oh, circumcised heathens. <laughs> the point of me saying this to you today, here it is, don't miss it is that you have to start to believe God on this level. Stop believing that because you're a Christian, you are a victim. Now, obviously what we don't wanna do is get into self-righteousness. That's where a lot of believers become obnoxious because you don't understand grace. <laughs> you don't understand that for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. There's no boasting before the Lord. We do not boast of our own righteousness because we don't have any. We're righteous, we're righteous because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. If you don't understand how your salvation works, God's law is that the wages of sin is death. So that means when sin happens, death is the payment. So what Jesus did on the cross was pay for sin so we didn't have to pay. That's why we get eternal life. And what happened was God took the blood of Jesus and he used that blood to wipe your sins off your account. That's called remission of sins. For the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So in other words, God took Jesus' blood and applied it to your account, wiped the sins off your ledger, and then God took Jesus' righteousness, and then Father God applied Jesus' righteous life, and he credited it to your account just as if you'd never sinned. So now Father God sees you through the eyes of Jesus. Just as if Adam had never sinned, just as if we had never sinned, just as if we were never separated from God. That's our position. We know practically speaking that that's gotta be worked out. Day by day, we have to learn how not to walk in our flesh and walk in righteousness. But the point of me bringing that up is to say, don't get in self-righteousness. This is not because of us. This is because of Jesus. So don't get it twisted. <laughs> don't get full of yourself. Don't get in pride. Don't start bragging on what you do and don't do because that's not why we say. God already told you it's not of works. It's not because of anything you did or didn't do. It's because of Christ. That's what the Lord meant when he said on the cross that it was finished. He wouldn't have said it was finished if it was something we did. He said it was finished when he got through dying. He paid and the veil in the temple was rent. That means that the way back to Father God was open when Jesus died, not because anything we did. That's why there's no boasting. We're not righteous because of ourselves. But the best news all day is that even though that's not my righteousness or earned righteousness, it's Jesus' righteousness, Father God gives it to me on my account through grace. So in other words, he said, I'm gonna give it to you as a free gift. So now I get to walk in it. <laughs> now I get to walk in it even though I didn't earn it, even though I don't deserve it. Now I get the benefit. That is the best news about the New Testament that righteousness has come 
apart from works. And Father God credits, he takes the blood of Jesus and wipes the sins out of my account. Then he takes Jesus' righteousness and credits my account with that. So now he sees me as righteous through Christ. So now I get the benefit. I, see, that's why the New Testament, that's why it's called gospel, because it's good news. Because that is this right here, that's mind blowing. That's why the name of the song is not mediocre grace. That's why the name of the song is not sometime grace. The name of the song is amazing grace, because that's amazing. That's a you can't even explain. That's not even something that a man would think of, more or less do. And God credits us with the righteousness of Christ and gives us all the favor that he gives the one that did live the perfect life. He gives you the favor of that one. And then you have a right through faith to walk in it. That's the best news all day. Because that's why you can't be listening to these mean or religious people that are teaching a works-based salvation. That's a lie. Salvation does not come by works, nor do we keep it by works. Salvation is by grace through faith. God saves you by grace through faith. And God teaches you how to live by grace through faith. It's all him. We receive it and we walk in it and we believe it, but it actually comes from him. Amen, Donna. Amen. And so that's what I mean when I say that you, you don't get puffed up, you don't get it twisted, like it's anything you did, because God says in the scripture, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Do you wanna know what that says in Hebrew? It's gonna gross you out, but it's in the Bible, so I don't care if it grosses you out. What God actually said in Hebrew is that your righteousness is like a menstruating woman's rags. God says human righteousness is like used tampons. That's in the Bible. God said your righteousness is like used tampons. That's how righteous we are by our own effort. That's why I ain't no boasting. Boasting about what? But in Christ, we get the benefit of Jesus' life. And that is just, just right here. See, it's amazing. That's why the name is so, that's amazing. And so once you understand that, then you can walk in that with boldness and confidence because now you know it's not based on me. Can't be based on me. <laughs> not perfect mistakes, sin. How's it going to be based on me? Not based on me, but I get the benefit. And then what he does is as you live day by day, step by step, week by week, month by month, year by year, he teaches you how to scoop the flesh out, <laughs> scoop out your ideas and get Christ in. More of him, less of the flesh. More of his ideas, less of my ideas. I decrease so Jesus can increase. That's the Christian walk. It's him giving me that day-by-day -day grace, him sending me that word, him washing me every day with his blood so I can be who I'm supposed to be. That's all him. That's not me. You know how we know that's true? Just don't pray for a day. Just don't get in the word. Just don't confess your sins and watch what happens. Watch that old man rise right back up. <laughs> if you think it's you, if you think it's you, just watch that old man just rise right back up. And you'll be all snappy and you have an attitude and you'd be like, Ugh, and a whole bunch of stuff will happen. That's because it takes the filling of the Holy Ghost, the washing of the blood of Jesus and the word of God every day until you die to be who you're supposed to be because his grace is him. Do you understand? But once it's mine, then I get the full benefits. I get the full benefits. And one of the benefits of being righteous before God Almighty is that unrighteous people don't get to have the victory over me. That God himself will fight for me. And that's the point of today's prophetic word. Today's prophetic word, lightning, is so you can start to believe God on that level, that God will move heaven and earth to fight for you. Do you understand? Some of y'all, that's the first time in your life you ever heard somebody tell you that. No more Christian as victim. That's why, if you ever wondered sometimes why men don't want to come to church, that's one of the main reasons why. Because what they've been taught about Christianity is, is a victim theology. And men are not drawn to that. Why? why? Why would a brother ever? That's not how Jesus treated his 12. How did Jesus get 12 men to follow him 
if they were going to be victims. That don't even make no sense. Somebody like Peter, somebody big and strong with their own business that knew how to fight, that wasn't afraid to fight. That doesn't make any sense. Follow me and I'll make you victims. That ain't what, <laughs> that ain't what the Lord said. And that's not how they lived. Okay. So if you're going to try to minister to men or those of you men that are watching, that whole thing about following Jesus makes your victim is a lie. That's incorrect. You're not a doormat. You're not there for somebody to beat up on. I'm going to say it again. When God commands you to forgive it so you don't have to hold on to the debt. Not there's not going to be any justice. It means you don't have to raise your own hand to get your justice. But what we have to start believing is that God will fight for us on that level. Do you know why some of you right now haven't been walking in that? Because you keep saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You keep meditating on what you've done. I stopped by to tell you, I got good news for you. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. That's why the Lord's death was so brutal because he took the punishment that your sin deserves. He took it in his body and it is illegal to pay for the same thing twice. Good God Almighty up in here. Jesus paid. So you don't have to earn it. You have to believe it and receive it because God is a good God. Say, Prophet Taylor, how can such a thing be? Because God is a good God. It's not the way man would do it. That's why so many people have a problem with it. That's why so many people do like Job and try to defend themselves based on what they do and they don't do. That's why God put the book of Job in the Bible so that we would know that when Satan comes after you, you cannot stand against the devil in your own name. You can't. That's why you have to learn how to stand in Jesus name, to stand in the righteousness that only comes by faith. That's given to me as a grace gift is mine because God gave it to me, not because I earned it. And some of you have been struggling with self-esteem and you keep saying, why would God do that for me? And you keep saying, because you're not worthy. I stopped by to tell you that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you, will forgive you and cleanse you from your sin that the word of God will polish you and make you be who you're supposed to be, that he makes you who he wants you to be, not you have to earn it because we can't. It's not possible. See, so the righteousness that you have has been conferred upon you through salvation and you can walk in it with boldness. And so you can stop saying today that I'm not worthy because that's true for everybody. Ain't none of us worthy. <laughs> It was based on worthiness would nobody be in heaven but Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the angels that didn't sin by following Lucifer and whatever other beast God has up there that I don't know, like them thing before he is. Um, that's all that would be in heaven if it was based on worthiness. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is worthy. So when we plug into him, then we get that benefit. So you can, God wants to move you, those of you that are listening to me right now. Like, oh, wait, I feel something prophetic coming. I'm seeing somebody with white dress on. I'm seeing somebody with maybe a white white hat, and but it's a pattern hat, maybe a veil. I don't think it's a wedding, but it's some kind of fancy pattern. And you got on white shoes. This looks like a black woman to me, I'm seeing. God's talking to you, as I'm seeing, as I'm describing you. I'm seeing uh, somebody, somebody surrounded by trees. Somebody's just forcing trees in the background. Um, Mm, and I'm seeing, ooh, I'm seeing somebody that has their children at their feet. And I, I'm seeing somebody that's pregnant. Somebody, you got a child and, and you're just growing in the womb. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. Why would the Holy Ghost interrupt me and have me say all that? Because the Holy Ghost is trying to prove to you that the prophetic is real. How do I know all that? I don't. That was the Holy Ghost. I saw it in the spirit. Because the Lord wants you to know he's talking to you. He's talking to you, okay? That you don't have to walk one more day in low self-esteem because we are made worthy in Christ. We become what we're supposed to become in Christ. That's why when the 24 elders are before the Lord in heaven, they cast their crowns down because any crown, any robe, anything that we have is because of Jesus, not because of us. You see that? So the point of today's prophetic word is again, you, let me put this, uh, prophetic word back up. It's lightning on the screen. 
you have to start to believe God on this level. Now, I want you to think about situations you've been in. I want you to think about situations that you're in now. Think about situations you're in now where if it seems like you're surrounded, you're surrounded and if you're in over your head, sometimes we have to admit that. Sometimes we get in over our head with debt. Sometimes we're in over our head with a relationship like you just with the wrong person or you just keep doing the wrong things. Sometimes it's substance abuse. Sometimes we, we can't control ourselves because we're hooked on substances. And that substance sometimes could be food. Sometimes we could be, be dealing with gluttony. We can't control our food. Sometimes you might look around in your life, you might have to admit you're in over your head. That's what King David is talking about in Samuel, that the sorrows of death that you know I was encompassed round about, where, every where I turned, it was enemies, it was darkness. Then David said he cried, he cried to God. So the reason principles are in the Bible is because if we do what they did, we get what they got. So that's what I meant when I said, you have to take your mask off, but you don't have to do it in front of other people. Just do it in your private prayer closet with God. That's another thing. That's another thing. Religious people are so into this outward show. Like when you go to church, they want to see you repent. They want to see you cry. Some denominations stand people up in, in the front and make you confess all your sins to the congregation. I do not recommend that approach because some things need to stay between your soul and your savior. But religious people seem to be kind of obsessed with the public show, that ain't what the Bible says. <laughs> Bible says you can go in your private closet, you can go somewhere where ain't nobody but God and you. And one of the reasons we have to do that is because you got to take the mask off. You got to cry, you got to scream, you got to holler, you got to confess, you got to tell the truth, you got to open, because God doesn't respond to you open. You got to open this, you got to open this, and you got to open this. Well, you need to be alone, so you don't have to worry about how you look. It's not about the outward show when you cry out to God. It's about being genuine and sincere. It's the heart cry. And then when that happens, then King David says, all of this kicks right on in, that God begins to move in a mighty, tangible way to come down from heaven and deliver you in no uncertain terms. And so what the Holy Ghost wanted me to communicate today was that we need to start believing God on this level. We need to start believing that if we are in over our heads and that if we are surrounded by our enemies and if we're dealing with a bunch of wicked, ungodly people, people that hate you, people that are trying to destroy you, how do you know an enemy? Because, you know, some people are frenemies. I had to get rid of some folks like that because I've had some frenemies in my life and it's like they're always needling you. They do it kind of in a jokey way, but if you notice the majority of what comes out of their mouth, is a criticism or a put down. But they keep telling you that they love you. No, they don't. No, they don't. They, they're always pointing out the worst in you. They're always reminding you of sins past. See, that's not the voice of God. That's not the Holy Ghost coming out their mouth. They're frenemies. Because your enemies tend to be obvious. Your enemies are always speaking negative things about you. And your enemies are always focused on the wrong you've done. Then frenemies are a little bit more subtle, though where they try to smile and act nice and be close to you, but they're always kind of picking at you. When you're dealing with any kind of situation like that, the Holy Ghost is saying through the scripture that like King David, we can cry out to God and believe God for a mighty deliverance, a physical deliverance, a tangible deliverance that can be seen from debt, from sickness, from enemies, from frenemies, from bad relationships, from substance abuse, whatever. So that's why I'm saying, don't be ashamed to admit when you're in over your head, but you can do it with you and the Lord alone. You don't have to do that in front of anyone. What you do have to do is cry out to God from your heart in a sincere way and take your mask off and stop pretending. Stop pretending that everything's all right if it's not, okay? But once you get real with God like that, then the Psalm has told us that the Lord will deliver us and the Holy Ghost is saying, that we need to start believing God on that way. Wait. Okay. For my people, says the Lord, I stand ready to deliver you as I have spoken in my word. Take my word and let it increase and feed your faith. Hold me to my word. Believe that I will do exactly what I said I would do, for I am no respecter of person. And if I delivered Israel and I delivered David, I will deliver you. 
says the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Did you hear that? You hear what the Holy Ghost said through the prophetic? That God is no respecter of person. If he did that for Israel, if he did that for David, he'll do it for us. So our takeaway, I'm going to say it one more time, then I'm going to wrap up. Wrap up. Our takeaway today is that we have to start believing God for a mighty physical deliverance. And that if we're in over our heads, that we can cry out to him and believe him on that level. And he will deliver us because don't no unrighteous person have a right. Don't nobody that don't honor God have a right to get victory over those that do. And our righteousness comes from him. It is not self-righteousness, it's grace righteousness. It's the gift of God through Jesus and his sacrifice and his blood. But I get to walk in it. It's mine by gifting, not mine by earning. Understand? Amen and amen. That's the best news all day. All right. Amen. So that's our, our live prophetic word for today. Thank you so much to those of you that are watching me live. Thank you for those of you that are watching on the replay. Uh, I hope that this word from God has been a blessing to you. It's a blessing to me. Uh, I'm encouraged as I see what the Holy Ghost has to bring out. Um, Amen. So those of you that want to bless me uh, financially, some people have asked me. Uh, I don't do what I do for money, obviously. Um, I do what I do because it's what the Lord told me to do. But if you want to bless me financially, you can send some money through Zelle. Now, I use Zelle because there's some other apps that have fees and some other apps that have been holding money and really bad stuff. Well, Zelle works with your bank. So there's no fees on your end and no fees on my end. So if you want to bless me financially, you can send some money through my app. Remember I told you that my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. And every time I do a video, I'm gonna ask you to do one thing for me. So the one thing I'm gonna ask you to do today is share this video. So uh, this video is gonna be on YouTube probably tomorrow or Tuesday, but share this video, this video on Facebook or share it when it com comes up on YouTube so that other people have a chance to increase their faith in this area so that uh, all believers can hear that we're supposed to believe God on this level. So the one thing I want you to do is share this video as many places as you can so that other people can hear this prophetic word, okay? All right, amen and God bless. That's it for this week. I will be back next Sunday, same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen, God bless. Have a blessed week, have a great week. And remember that we got a right as righteous people, grace righteousness, not earn righteousness, we got a right to not be defeated by ungodly and wicked people. And we can cry out and call out to God and God will move in a mighty way to deliver us. Amen. And God bless.